Time to talk Ohio State football. We bring in Steve Hellwagon. He is the senior Big Ten writer for uh, 247 Sports. You can also catch his uh, work at Bucknuts, of course, the Ohio State platform there at 247. Steve, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. All right. Uh, of course, we've got a recruiting situation where Ohio State's always a major player across the nation and uh, goes wherever they need to go to grab the very best uh, uh, recruiting. As we mentioned uh, before we started to record here, uh, a bit uh, quiet on the um, holiday weekend, but at the same time, uh, the Buckeyes looking toward June and uh, uh, some re uh, vital recruiting trips, obviously. Yeah, during the month of June, Mark, Ohio State, like a lot of colleges, will host a one-day camp for key prospects. Ohio State has three of those scheduled. Uh, the first one is on uh, June 8th, the second one is on June 12th, and the third one is on June 16th, and those are all held on campus at the football facility there at Ohio State, and uh, generally uh, they're looking for uh, seniors, juniors, uh, key prospects. They'll have anywhere from 200 to 400 players, maybe even more at each one of those camps. A lot of times they'll have uh, coaches from other schools like Cincinnati or a Mid-American Conference school uh, in as well to help uh, coach players at those camps. Uh, basically, they, they do uh, 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 individual testing in the morning and then drill work in the afternoon. And then, and then uh, running uh, running backs will uh, try and catch passes against linebackers and wide receivers and DBs and uh, the offensive linemen uh, without pads will will uh, work on blocking against defensive linemen and these kind of things. So it is uh, <clears throat> great competition and a chance for the Ohio State coaches to work one on one with key prospects and and a lot of times uh, uh, over the years we've seen any number of guys who have come into the camp and done really well. I think one of the great cases was Darren Lee, a, a linebacker for the Buckeyes a few years ago. Luke Fickle got him into the, the uh, summer camp and really liked what he saw and convinced Urban Meyer that uh, they should take a flyer on him. And he ended up being a two-year starter and is now obviously a National Football League player. So a lot of positive things can come out of it. Uh, they've got a couple key guys, I think, uh, that already have offers who are due in athlete prospect out of Louisville, Kentucky, by the name of Milton Wright. Uh, he'll be there. And then another guy, a big offensive lineman, 6'8", 315 pounds, Jonathan Allen uh, from Dayton Dunbar. Both those guys already have offers, but uh, a chance for them to work one-on-one -on -one with the Ohio State coaches. Darren Lee, obviously, a star for the 14 National Championship team, and not just playing in the NFL, but uh, starting with the New York Jets and very much an impact player. Uh, there in New York. Uh, we got Steve Hellwagen on the line from 247 Sports. Uh, catch his work uh, at Bucknuts, uh, the platform for Ohio State football and athletics. Uh, Denzel Ward, of course, as we turn our attention toward the cornerbacks, gone. Gone to the NFL, another most likely impact player at that level who sprang all the way up to the fourth position in the draft to the Cleveland Browns. Position coach, Kerry Coombs. This is a little bit more under the radar for fringe Ohio State fans and college football fans moving on to the Tennessee Titans uh, to become a, a part of Mike Vrabel's first staff there in Tennessee. So different uh, philosophy there, different uh, set of players. Uh, Jeffrey Okuda, probably the number one guy coming back. Uh, your thoughts about the cornerbacks as we start to dive through these positional groups? Yeah, I think it's going to be kind of a transitional year there. Um, Tabor Johnson, who had coached at Ohio State previously under Jim Trestle, uh, he was hired basically to come back as the cornerback's coach. So over the last 12 or 15 years, however long it's been, Ohio State's had two cornerbacks coaches, Tabor Johnson, then Kerry Combs, and now Tabor Johnson again, which is kind of interesting of itself. And he did have – uh, some pretty good prospects, uh, pretty good players who played there in the late uh, 2000s, last few years under Jim Trestle uh, before he left. I know he was at Arkansas for a while. I think he was at Temple last year. So Tabor Johnson will come in and preside over that competition. Uh, Damon Arnett, <clears throat> excuse me, is a guy <clears throat> who started uh, most of last season 
uh, for the Buckeyes at cornerback, and he is obviously returning and will probably be the lead cornerback going into this season. Uh, they had a junior college transfer, Kendall Sheffield, as well, who uh, was uh, – kind of the third cornerback last year uh, with Denzel Ward and Damon Arnett. So it looks like those two guys may get the first chance to start. But as you mentioned, uh, Jeffrey Okuda, outstanding athlete, uh, he was a backup, probably the fourth cornerback last year and was kind of bumped up into production there for the bowl game against USC uh, when Denzel Ward decided to sit it out and uh, protect his NFL draft stock. So, uh, those three guys are the leaders. Sean Wade was an outstanding uh, signee a year ago, but uh, injury kind of sent him to the sideline, and he didn't get to play much, or rather didn't play at all. He was redshirted last year in 2017, so uh, he had a great spring coming back from his injury. So they've got a pretty solid top four, I think, there at the cornerback position. And then they even brought in a couple of guys, uh, early enrollees uh, this spring, Tyreek Johnson out of Jacksonville, Florida, a, a blue chip kid, probably a national top 30 or top 40 prospect. Uh, he was uh, part of that uh, recruiting class. And uh, Seven Banks was another guy uh, out of Florida that uh, also came in early. So uh, you've got four or five guys. I didn't mention Marcus Williamson as well. He'll be a sophomore this upcoming season. So they actually they have options at the cornerback position. I think they start with Arnett and Sheffield and then go from there with uh, Wade, Okuda, and Johnson. Yeah, when I mention Okuda being the top guy back, that much more in terms of anticipation of uh, fulfilling his promise. Uh, the reason the bowl game was uh, uh, important in particular was because Coombs had the philosophy of rotating three cornerbacks through two spots. And once um, Denzel Ward decided to sit out the USC game, then uh, that made uh, Okuda a front and center in the rotation. And uh, he got some more impact minutes there. Damon Arnett coming off a nice uh, redshirt sophomore season, part-time starter there with 44 tackles, five tackles for loss and two interceptions. Kendall Sheffield, a bit of a slow start for him, but a prime prospect who uh, played a little bit better down the stretch. And you mentioned Sean Wade uh, with all the talent in the world as a five-star and now a redshirt freshman. Moving on to safety, uh, Urban Meyer had made the case uh, a number of times during spring sessions that this is his biggest concern. It goes from a place where a year ago Jordan Fuller was looking for playing time to one year later Jordan Fuller coming back as the solo tackler leader from 2017 and the one mainstay and then the rest of the guys scrambling. Again, plenty of talent, but not necessarily guys that we can count on. Yeah, they lost Damon Webb, who was a senior last year. He was number three on the team in tackles with 61, and uh, he's going to try uh, his talents down the National Football League. So I, uh, you, know, you look at it, Jordan Fuller will return for his junior year, and I think a lot of people are mentioning him as an All-Big Ten, if not a preseason All-American type uh, player at the one safety position, and some of the comments that I saw, both from Greg Schiano, the defensive coordinator, and Alex Grinch, the co-coordinator who was hired from Washington State, uh, basically uh, to coach the safeties and coordinate the defense, along with Greg Schiano, was that they love Jordan Fuller as a quarterback of the defense, a guy that can get everybody lined up and make plays, which uh, if you can do both of those things, the, that makes you a special player. Uh, this past year, he was number two on the team in tackles. He had 70 tackles, whereas Jerome Baker, the linebacker who opted to go pro, he had 72. So Jordan Fuller was right there at the top of the tackle list. Uh, three tackles for loss, two interceptions as well. So he had just an outstanding season. And they are going to be looking at him for leadership and also playmaking ability. The other safety spot, uh, they had competition during the spring. It was wide open. I do not believe they have a firm number one guy at the other safety position just yet. I think Isaiah Pryor, very talented player. Uh, he is going into his sophomore year. You've also got uh, Jason Wint, a sophomore who's in that race. Uh, Brendan White, who's kind of moved back and forth between wide receiver and safety. Of course, many people remember his dad, William White, 
uh, played for the Buckeyes in the late 80s as well and uh, went on to a long NFL career, played a long time with the Detroit Lions as well. And uh, another guy, Amir Reek, who was an outstanding special teams player for the Buckeyes last year, made a lot of tackles on special teams. You got those four guys when you're talking about Reap, White, Jason Went, and Isaiah Pryor. Those four guys are all battling. Then you have a blue chipper coming in, Josh Proctor, uh, out of Oklahoma. He's coming in uh, this summer and will try and mix things up as well. Also, uh, Marcus Hooker, the younger brother of Malik Hooker, who was an All-American for the Buckeyes in 2016. He's also going to be enrolling this summer. So you got five or six names there. My guess is between Grinch and Chiano, uh, they're going to find somebody that can man that other safety position. And if it has to be a committee of guys who rotate inside in there alongside uh, Jordan Fuller, I don't think it's going to end up being as big of an issue as uh, perhaps Coach uh, Meyer is concerned about, other than the fact youth and experience. You're talking about putting a sophomore in there not a junior or a senior who's been around football a long time. Yeah, the freshman Proctor comes in as the seventh-rated safety, according to 247, an outfit that uh, you might be familiar with, Steve. Yeah, uh, with them. <laughs> Brendan White, uh, he's going to be the name that's going to be easiest. So you threw a ton of names out at us. I've got a, t a ton of names, basically the same names listed here and uh, what they've contributed to date, and not a whole lot there, obviously. We're talking about... Uh, raw prospects, but at the same time, Brendan White going to be the guy that I'm going to remember for what you just stated. Old number 35, his dad for the Buckeyes uh, back in the day, roaming around at safety. And then, yeah, he was with the Lions for quite a long time. Got Steve Hellwagon on the line from 247 Sports, catches work at Bucknuts, uh, talking Ohio State athletics throughout the year. Of course, football front and center here. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Please subscribe uh, with our uh, content analysis and uh, breakdowns across the board in college football. All right. Uh, the kicking, I would consider Steve to be stable, steady, not spectacular, especially from distance. Sean Nuremberger has certainly had a sordid career for kicking for a national championship team as a freshman to getting unseated, to getting hurt, to being back into it. Uh, with a nice 2017 at 17 of 21, but all those misses basically came between 40 and 49 yards, and they didn't try and pass that. So he appears to be in good place, uh, a good place to retain his spot, but they still recruited uh, one of the top kickers in the country. Yeah, they uh, actually uh, they've got a couple of guys there that uh, will continue to compete. I don't think it's uh, set in stone that it's Sean Nerdberger's job, although he is the incumbent. And as you said, uh, he has kicked. Uh, he was the starter in, in 2014, the starter last year, and uh, goes into 2018 right now with the inside track to be the starter because, you know, what would basically change between he and Blake Hobble, he won the job last year. You would think maybe it'll be the same. Uh, Nuremberger, as you mentioned, 17 of 21, which is a pretty good percentage, 81% on his field goals. But his longest one was 44 yards. He had two kicks blocked. Uh, so I guess we'll have to wait and see uh, who wins that competition. Blake Hobble was the kickoff specialist uh, last season. He handled 87 of the 104 kickoffs with uh, Nuremberger also involved with some of that. Uh, they had an issue last year kicking the ball out of bounds at times. Uh, obviously don't want to do that and give uh, teams the extra yardage on the kickoffs. But uh, I guess we'll see what the kickoff rules and everything kind of shake out this year. But I look at it that it's Nuremberger's job, at least on field goals, uh, to uh, to lose. To my knowledge, I believe he is perfect in his career on extra point kicks. And, again, you know, in college football, they line the ball up at the three-yard line. It, it's basically a, a formality uh, to make the extra points, but uh, Nuremberger does have that record to his credit. And I guess we'll just see how that unfolds uh, this coming year. Uh, the punting situation, that they, they lost uh, Cam Johnston, the Australian uh, punter who was big on that rugby kick, that that rollout uh, running kick uh, that they used for a while, Blake – or. Uh, Drew Crisman uh, came in last year as a freshman and, and did an outstanding job. I want to say, I, I have his statistics here, he averaged just over 44 yards per punt, which is a pretty good average. 
Of course, a lot of times you're more concerned about the net and the touchbacks and, and these kind of things. Where do you give the other team the ball possession with the punt? Do you place it properly? And I think Crisman did a bang-up job uh, last year as a freshman. So um, I would say that the kicking, the at least between the, the play kicker and the punter, it's a B-plus unit, maybe an A-minus unit uh, with room to improve going into this coming season. Yeah, so special teams in good shape. Of course, this is just part of it when you talk place kicker and punter. They're the first two positions people think of, but of course, you've got to cover those punts and return the kickoffs and the punts and the coverage units are extremely important as well. We can dive into that maybe later throughout the summer. Um, yeah, we got um, Steve Hellwagon on the line from 2547 Sports talking Ohio State football. Not much chat on the line. I can pretty much explain that. That's pretty easy. Uh, most people that work right now, Steve, we, yeah. we get tons of Ohio State comments and questions. So what I'm going to probably need to do here is I'm going to have to gather those up and make a kind of a mailbag section and uh, throw them at you all at once uh, because we uh, we were talking other teams last night, Steve, and I was getting probably a third of the comments about Ohio State uh, while we were talking about other teams. So I'll gather those up for the next time and give you some of the, the best comments and questions we receive as we break down Buckeyes football. All right, Steve, uh, unfortunately here in the last uh, few weeks, and I don't think we had a chance uh, to get together since. Uh, so it's been a little while, but at the same time wanted to, uh, not, I would be remiss in, in not mentioning the passing of Earl Bruce uh, and uh, his fine tenure with Ohio state that not only dates to the years that he was the head coach on the sideline, but on Woody Hayes, staff prior to that, of course, replacing Woody Hayes in 1979, and then really stayed attached to the program throughout his retirement. And uh, just your thoughts as a longtime uh, guy who's uh, rooted for and covered this team as closely as anyone, your thoughts about Earl Bruce? Yeah, Mark, uh, Earl Bruce was the head coach at Ohio State uh, when I enrolled there in 1986. He was the coach uh, for the, my first two years that I was on campus. And obviously, uh, his stay at Ohio State as the head coach lasted nine years. But basically, he was a lifelong Ohio State Buckeye. And that's interesting because uh, he is a native of, of Maryland and was recruited uh, to Ohio State, uh, I want to say, by uh, Wes Fessler, who uh, preceded Woody Hayes. Earl Bruce got injured in his freshman uh year at Ohio State and uh, was not able uh, to play as an upperclassman, but Woody Hayes took over as the head coach and saw that uh, Earl had this uh, innate ability, I guess, to, to help, help the staff and, and help. he served basically as a student coach uh, his last several years, eventually returned to Ohio State as an assistant, uh, as an assistant coach in 1968 when Ohio State won the national championship on what is regarded as one of the great coaching staffs in the history of college football. Talking about Lou Holtz was an assistant at Ohio State for one year in 1968 when they won the national championship. Bill Mallory, uh, I know that there are some reports coming out now that Bill Mallory, uh, the former Indiana head coach, uh, may be in ill health as well. And, uh, you know, his situation uh, could could be uh, looking pretty dire uh, for him. But obviously, uh, just a, a great uh, football coach, both as an assistant and as a head coach. A lot of the places that he was at, uh, he was on that staff, George Chomp, uh, Esko Sarkinen, uh, so many guys that uh, went on uh, from Ohio State and did uh, big things on their own. Uh, in terms of Earl, uh, he came from Iowa State to Ohio State uh, in – uh, 1979. People will remember December of 78 was the uh, uh, Gator Bowl where Woody Hayes uh, punched the Clemson player and was fired from the job, basically, uh, from Ohio State, said, I'm not going to resign. You're going to have to fire me. And uh, they did and uh, conducted a search that winter. And Earl Bruce was brought in. And, and it was kind of met with some skepticism. I think at the time, he'd done pretty well at Iowa State. But you know, people were looking for Lou Holtz, who had really kind of put Arkansas on the map at that point uh, to uh, to be the the guy that uh, followed uh, Woody Hayes. But uh, they ended up with Earl Bruce, and he did fine at Ohio State. Uh, he won five of his nine games against the University of Michigan, which uh, obviously uh, that rivalry 
he is a guy that uh, added a lot of uh, seasoning to that rivalry over the years, both as the coach and with comments he made in years uh, uh, after that, that uh, if there's one game you're going to win, uh, you, you got to win that game. And if you're the head coach at Ohio State and you can win that game, you can walk down the sidewalk of High Street and Broad Street in Columbus, Ohio, and hold your head up high. But if you lose that game, you better be walking in the back alleys because nobody wants to see your face. So um, <laughs> that was kind of a unique way to put it. But um, Earl's first team in 1979 – was one of the best in school history. They won their first 11 games. Arch Leister is the quarterback. They went to the Rose Bowl, though, and uh, they ran into uh, the Heisman uh, Trophy winner, uh, Charles White, and also uh, Anthony Munoz, a guy that uh, people in Ohio here know all about now, uh, was an All-American at USC and then played uh, Hall of Fame career with the Cincinnati Bengals. And uh, USC denied Ohio State the national championship that year. That was probably the best team Earl Bruce had. He got back to the Rose Bowl in 1984, but again, uh, they lost to USC. Uh, that team had a couple of great freshmen. Chris Carter, Chris Spielman played on that team and did outstanding in that Rose Bowl. They lost to USC. I'm going to tell you the, a couple of the things I remember. In 84, uh, Keith Byers set a school record uh, almost 300 yards in a game against Illinois where they were trailing uh, 24 to nothing. Keith Byers brought them all the way back uh, to win that game. Uh, that was amazing. Uh, they beat Michigan that year to go to the Rose Bowl. In 1985, uh, Keith Byers was injured. He was probably in line to be the Heisman Trophy uh, favorite. Uh, he was edged out by uh, Doug Flutie the year before, in 1984, when Flutie threw that uh, Hail Mary pass for Boston College against Miami. And uh, so they lose Keith Byers in 85. The season's kind of teetering on the brink. Iowa came in with Chuck Long as the quarterback. Hayden Fry is the coach. And Ohio State uh, knocked them off, uh, beat them. I want to say it was 22-13, to 13, and Iowa was the number one ranked team in the country. That may be uh, one of Earl Bruce's shining moments, I would say, as uh, the head coach. And then the year after that, wow, 86. They lost their first two games, Mark to Alabama in the kickoff classic, and then they went out to Washington and lost something on the order of 40-7. to seven. And now Ohio State has lost its first two games in a season for the first time since the 1890s. Uh, a tremendous uh, stretch, but uh, they reeled off the next nine games. They're in position to go to the Rose Bowl. If they can beat Michigan and Jim Harbaugh at Ohio Stadium, it was a four-hour game, a classic, and Jim Harbaugh guaranteed the victory and delivered on it. I think the score was 26 to 24. Uh, they had Jamie Morris rush for over 200 yards. Chris Spielman, 29 tackles in that game for Ohio State, just basically stood on his head. So those are some memories. That one's not a very pleasant one, but I got to tell you, if you didn't care who won the game, that was one heck of a college football game. Uh, that was the first time I ever saw an Ohio State-Michigan game uh, in person, and it was a pretty good one to, to start out with, although the result uh, wasn't good. He kind of fell out of favor after that. Uh, Chris Carter was ineligible in 87 for taking extra benefits. The team was ranked in the top five to start the season, but gradually just kind of went downhill, lost a couple home games, lost at home to Indiana 31-10, to and Earl himself, labeled that the darkest day in Ohio State football history, which uh, kind of says it all, but uh, kind of fell out of favor with the administration, the boosters, and was fired uh, after they lost at home to Iowa. Team rallied around him. They wore the Earl headbands, went up to Michigan, knocked off Michigan. Neither team was very good that year in 88, but uh, or 87 rather, but uh, that's how Earl went out uh, in a blaze of glory, winning his last game at Ohio State. Then obviously he was, I think, coach at Northern Iowa for one year and then on to Colorado State for six or seven years, ended up in the College Football Hall of Fame. And uh, after that, retired basically to Columbus and spent his last 20 years on the radio uh, here in Columbus on 610 WTVN and AM, uh, probably the top AM station in the market, uh, providing analysis of Ohio State football, and uh, never, never gave up his love for Ohio State despite what happened to him and uh, was always a Buckeye through and through. And, uh, you know, it's going to be weird going to the games. His seat in the press box was right down from mine, and we would sit there and we would 
talk and tell stories. And, and uh, I think a year or two ago they were playing um, – Tulsa and there was a rain delay. So we really, <laughs> we were just sitting there, you know, filling time for an hour while the rain was coming down. And uh, uh, a lot of the former players were sitting up there with us and reminiscing. And it is going to be truly different uh, to be there this year and not have Earl, who is uh, one of Urban Meyer's uh, biggest influences and mentors. And think about this um, in the last 15 or 16 years in college football, who have won national championships? Uh, Nick Saban, who coached for Earl Bruce, Pete Carroll, coach for Earl Bruce, uh, Jim Trestle had the one, plus his others at Division One AA, and uh, Urban Meyer has won three as well. So uh, I want to say something on the order of 12 of the last 15 or 16 national championships have been at the 1A level, the uh, FBS level, have been won by coaches who spent at least a year or more with Earl Bruce. So that'll tell you a little bit about his impact on uh, college football and his coaching tree and uh, kind of the legacy he's left behind. Even for Arden, Ohio State fans, what you brought up there uh, right at the end and putting that into perspective in terms of his influence and impact, uh, I don't think anyone, uh, very few people have put together in that manner to, to really uh, put into context uh, the influence that he had on the next generation of coaches and their legacy moving forward. Um, yeah, I have so many memories as well, a little bit uh, more of a distance than you, especially in the, the more recent years, uh, being about two and a half or three hours away from Columbus uh, during my um, years growing up. But uh, yeah, that Iowa game, uh, I believe it was pouring down rain, pouring down defense, rain. as you mentioned, yeah. played a great game, uh, blocked punt and Chuck Long was the Heisman favorite, uh, finished second that year, and they really put the clamps on him. Of course, the... Uh, 86 season, 87 Cotton Bowl game against Texas A&M in which uh, the team was surprised to see Earl Bruce uh, don the fedora and the uh, the suit uh, because he had his regular Ohio State gear on in the, um, the locker room. And then um, based on my memory, Steve, you may correct me here, um, it was just one of those things where leading up to the Cotton Bowl with all the interaction between the two teams and the banquets and so forth, Jackie Sherrill always dressed to the nines, given a little bit more of his due and Earl Bruce feeling maybe a little bit disrespected. And, and uh, he made that statement. That's true. I think you make a very good point that, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, Earl was a little bit portly. And I think that uh, that was one thing that people held against him was his appearance that, you know, he didn't look like, uh, I mean, they'd had Woody Hayes, and, and obviously, you know, his look changed as he grew older over the years, obviously. But uh, I think that uh, that that he wanted to project an image that uh, he is uh, a straightforward, clean cut, uh, uh, just a classy guy, and I think that that was what. Uh, People will remember, you're right, that that Michigan game, there's a, a famous photo of him being hoisted up on the shoulders. There's uh, pictures of him in the locker room after that game, you know, and everybody's emotional with uh, his last game. You know, John Cooper uh, came in after him, and I don't know that they were really close uh, for a while, but by 96, Coach Cooper invited Earl Bruce to come back and speak to the team at the senior tackle. And this was kind of a, an interesting thing. The senior tackle was something that they did on the Friday before the Michigan game. If they were going to go to Michigan, they would, at the end of practice, all the seniors would hit the dummy one last time. And uh, then they would travel to Michigan and play the game if it was at home. A lot of times they did it at Ohio Stadium and invited fans to come in. And in 1996, Ohio State was undefeated. And, uh, playing to, to get in the national championship hunt. This was before the BCS, so they were still going to go to the Rose Bowl, and they did go to the Rose Bowl. Uh, but they were hopeful finishing you know, number one that season had they won out. And uh, he brought in Earl Bruce, and he spoke – uh, to the team and, and talked about how you got to give Michigan respect, but they put their pants on one leg at a time, just like you do, and very emphatic about what he said. Well, 
come to find out that Michigan had come down to since down to Columbus early and their players were sitting in the hotel outside campus watching all this transpire on television and they they weren't having a very good year in fact I think they lost to Purdue the week before to fall out of the Rose Bowl race they couldn't go they couldn't do anything but they could spoil Ohio State's undefeated season and uh, they were pumped up, and that's exactly what they did the next day, 13-9. to 9, uh, They upset John Cooper's team. And, uh, you know, I think, as we said in recent years, uh, Earl was kind of the elder statesman of Ohio State football, Buckeye through and through. And uh, you always uh, always had an opinion about something. We, As I say, we would sit up there in the press box, and, and sometimes it would veer off into politics or uh, college athletics or – uh, you know, football or, or anything else. So Ohio State was getting ready to play USC. And Pete Carroll, who had actually coached for uh, Earl on one of his staffs there in the 80s at Ohio State, you know, he always had that that fun and freewheeling way about him. And uh, Earl, as they were getting ready to go out to USC, made the comment, you know, we don't play grab ass here, buddy, you know, something like that. And uh, uh, <laughs> that comment did <laughs> Didn't fare too well either. Ohio State got blown out at the Coliseum. But, uh, yeah, a very opinionated guy. You always could get an idea where you stood with Earl. And to look at that nine-year tenure that he had at Ohio State, it was it was very solid, very strong. He sometimes gets a knock as, and at the time it was 9-3 and three Earl, old 9-3 yeah. and three Earl, because he had six consecutive, I believe, was the number nine yep. and three seasons. The only thing that broke that was playing an extra game in the one season that you mentioned of '86, where they actually went ten and three. Ten and three, Earl. But uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot but, of ups and downs well, in his time. Uh, I think one of the things that they don't get credit for is the the out of conference opponents that they played. Uh, in that first year in '79, they went out and played UCLA in the Coliseum. And they trailed in that game. Arch Schleister led a big comeback. As the years unfolded, they played Florida State uh, as Bobby Bowden was in building that program in the early 80s. They weren't quite Florida State just yet, but Florida State came up to Ohio State two years in a row and beat the Buckeyes. Uh, Stanford with John Elway, they played them. It wasn't a case back then where you only played one uh, uh, power five or power six, however many power conferences there were probably more because of the Southwest conference was still in existence then as well. But, uh, it wasn't a case where you just played one of those. A lot of years you played two and sometimes you even played three major conference opponents before you got into big 10 play. So, uh, different time in college football and, and you were going to lose a game here and there. Yeah, you mentioned Washington, you mentioned Alabama. They played a a home and home with Colorado during that time. LSU was in there. LSU, the One of the uh, famous Tiger. stories at LSU in 87 is last year they went down there and he saw the itinerary from CBS or whoever had uh, put together the timing and it said Ohio State entrance and then it said cheer <laughs> or something and they wanted to have some big a thing before they brought LSU out as the second team. Well, that that kind of runs counter to what you see most places. The home team typically is going to come out first uh, to have that roar. That way the visiting team doesn't have to be on the field when uh, that old theatrics and everything go off. So uh, Earl held his ground and the game officials were there like, no, you got to go. And he's like, no, I don't. No, I don't. I'm going to stay right here until they come out. So a time kind of stood still there in Baton Rouge for a couple of minutes. Yes. Yeah, I'll tell you Earl Bruce, man, if he gets set in his ways, uh, he wasn't going to deviate for somebody. And he really had, as you mentioned, five and four against Michigan. And in those nine and three seasons, boy, they, they were just so close to having special seasons and to consider that he did have the best record in the big 10. And it was all about the big 10 then. It was all about getting to the Rose Bowl, winning the Big Ten. Now, unfortunately, he had a few teams that tied for Big Ten championships but didn't go to the Rose Bowl. He had that 1980 team that, after the Big 79, finished uh, w- uh, started the season out as the consensus number one and tripped up against UCLA and really had a disappointing season. But those 81-82 teams stumbled out of the block with early losses, but they rallied. They went up to Ann Arbor in uh, 81 and pulled off a big upset with Arch Schleister scoring late. 82, quirk in the scheduling, if you remember this, Steve. Ohio State beat Michigan. Um, 
in wet conditions in Columbus, 24-14. They go 7-1 and one that year, but Michigan played an extra game and went 8-1. and one. That allowed them to go to the Rose Bowl, even though the Buckeyes won head-to-head, -head, and they both only lost one game in conference. So some unusual circumstances there. Yeah, no question about it. It was a different time, I think, uh, in college athletics in the Big Ten. And uh, some schools did play nine conference games some years, and others only played eight. I can't explain it. I have no idea why they did it other than for scheduling reasons, perhaps. Uh, you know, we see nowadays that uh, the Big Ten is playing nine conference games, and a lot of that is because of television, because of their own network, which they have a, a stake in, the Big Ten network. It gives the Big Ten network a stronger inventory of games uh, today to have more conference games on the schedule. And in basketball, they're going to 20. They've never played 20 conference games in uh in Big Ten basketball, 18 has always been the high watermark, but because they own their own television outlet, they want to give that outlet the best inventory they can, and that's more conference games against one another and keeping that revenue uh, in-house. So uh, I can't explain why some teams played nine games and some played eight in the 1980s. That's one that's going to mystify people forever and, as you said, did create uh, more controversy for a league than in the 70s with votes and, and different things by the athletic directors was rife with controversy. It continued on, and, of course, now we have uh, the tiebreakers in place in the championship game. And, you know, when you look at Urban Meyer and you think about this, I'll just throw this in there. If you want to compare his records at Ohio State to what any of his predecessors did, I think that, that – that there are two factors. One, he's playing nine Big Ten games, has to win his division to get to a championship game, then has to win the championship game. That's not something Jim Trestle ever had to do. In fact, Trestle had a number of years where he shared a championship, and, of course, the same with uh, Cooper and Earl and Woody and on down. So it's going to be kind of an apples and oranges comparison going forward. There's only one Big Ten champion in a given year going forward, whereas when those guys were coaching, there could be as many as three in a given year. So that's a great point, Steve. So if you would take every Urban Meyer year, even 2012, they were on probation, but uh, not his issue there, and they win every game, he at least ties for the Big Ten Championship every year because he's never lost more than one conference game. Right. So he would have tied for all of them uh, won or won the outright. They've won and the division every year, even though they were not uh, eligible to go to the championship the first year because of the NCAA sanctions. They have technically finished at the top of the standings within the division, either alone or tied with uh, Penn State or Michigan State, and gotten aced out to go to the championship game because of a head-to-head -head loss. Uh, but otherwise, they uh, they've been right. They've won six straight division championships. Yeah. So based on the way it used to be counted as a shared championship, counted as a championship for the school, uh, Urban Meyer would have seven Big Ten championships or six if you left out the probation year. Yeah, he'd be right there. <laughs> that, that's uh, that's not bad. And, and the one last thing I'll say about Earl's legacy in regards to wins and losses and championships is that uh, he did win the Big Ten or at least tied in, what, 79, 81, 84, 86. Yep. And so, yeah. for a program that really stumbled in bowl play at the end of Woody's tenure and then definitely under Cooper at three and eight, uh, Earl Bruce won the bowl games, uh, a nice Fiesta Bowl win against Pitt in 83 dramatically, and uh, I believe five and three in bowl games. So he succeeded in postseason play as well. Definitely. They beat uh, Texas A&M, as you referenced, in that Cotton Bowl. Had a tough loss to Penn State in one of the early Fiesta Bowls. It was probably one of the games that helped put the Fiesta Bowl uh, really on the map. They matched up Ohio State and Penn State. were lucky to get them uh, together when Penn State was still an independent around uh, 80 or 81, I believe. And uh, Ohio State had a lead at halftime, something like 17 to 10. But uh, uh, Penn State rallied with a big second half. Kurt Warner, Todd Blackledge, I think, were the guys on that team, and and they beat the Buckeyes. Uh, Joe Paterno against Earl Bruce, I believe, the only time that they would have squared off against one another uh, as head coaches at Ohio State and Penn State. But uh, yeah, a lot of great memories. Um, they went down and won a Citrus Bowl uh, uh, one of the years, uh, 
and uh, just uh, up and down the line, just uh, a lot of great memories for his nine years. Of course, it came at a formative time for myself, uh, my teenage years into my college years, and you always remember the things that you experience and you see uh, in person, obviously, and, and those were some of my most vivid memories. I can remember stuff about that much easier, Mark, than I can remember what happened this past year with Ohio State. So, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's kind of the way it is, the, I guess. Absolutely, there. I'm right there with you. If somebody needs a score from the '80s, I got it right here. But uh, last season, eh, I might have to look that I'll up. Look it up. <laughs> yeah. Before we let you go, Steve, uh, there are some folks in the chat that are just kind of generally excited about this TCU game coming up this fall of course we don't have personnel breakdowns at this point we'll deal with that in the coming months but uh an interesting uh, matchup for the buckeyes this year i think it is uh it's a uh quote unquote neutral site game being played at at&t stadium but that's only about a half hour from the tcu uh campus in fact i map quested it. i think it's 21 or 22 miles from at&t stadium into fort worth where uh, tcu is and uh ohio, ohio state's been down there uh twice had two very good memories here in recent years beating oregon for the national championship and then coming back this past year and uh thumping on uh, USC uh, there in the Cotton Bowl as well. And, Mark, what was interesting to me, I was talking to somebody about that game just recently, was it was a legitimate sellout. You had Ohio State and USC both coming from over a 1,000 miles away for what was essentially a meaningless exhibition. It was so meaningless that Denzel Ward, the All-American for the Buckeyes, didn't even play. And so, yeah, it matched the number five, number six teams in the country or whatever they were, the Pac-12 and the Big Ten champions. But uh, I was very surprised that every seat in the stadium was filled. And it kind of speaks to the, uh, the fan base in Texas that loves football, that supports the game regardless of who's playing. Plus, the, the way I was very surprised, the way the USC people traveled in from Los Angeles for that game and the Ohio State people uh, traveling in. Uh, from Columbus, and I assume a lot of Ohio State people will travel in. I think TCU is obviously going to have the larger ticket uh, dispersal. It's probably part of their season ticket package, if I'm not mistaken. I would assume because they want to fill the stadium, uh, first of all. But uh, secondly, I think Ohio State will be well represented down there. It'll be somewhat of a TCU home game. TCU, great defensive team under Gary Patterson, and I think that that is something Ohio State has to take into account, that TCU, probably the best defensive team in a conference that's not obviously known for its defense, the Big 12, where everybody, uh, if you're not scoring 45 points, you're not trying type thing, but uh, – uh, I think Ohio State, uh, with Dwayne Haskins at quarterback and the, the two 1,000-yard rushers, Dobbins and Weber in the backfield and the wide receivers that they have, Paris Campbell and the rest, uh, should be able to put some points on the board. Ohio State kind of kind of goes into that on a on a, uh, uh, a, a an incline. They start with Oregon State was one and eleven. Then they play Rutgers in, in an early Big Ten game. Both those games at Ohio Stadium. Uh, before going on the road so they can work out the kinks the first two weeks and have their best football ready to go, have Dwayne Haskins ready to go at quarterback and go down there and take their chances against a respectable TCU team. We're seeing them ranked anywhere from 15th to 20th in a lot of the preseason polls, and it's going to be a fun game. Uh, two schools that haven't played in a long time uh, going to hook it up, and uh, TCU's been one of the best programs in college football since Patterson got there. It would mean a lot if the Buckeyes can go on the road, per se, and win that game. In addition to that defense, uh, they bring a lot of players in space that can do a lot of uh, uh, game-changing things. If you caught the Alamo Bowl against Stanford, they trailed 21-3, and they were just they were just too quick and too fast for Stanford, yeah. just a different style of game, and uh, just have a lot of quick uh, guys yeah. with explosive speed. Uh, that'll be an interesting matchup on the outside between all those athletes going at it. I think that that win in the bowl game puts this game with Ohio State in an entirely different light because had they lost to Stanford, I think you would have a hard time selling even the Ohio State players on this is a legitimate team. But when they beat Stanford, you know, a team, a rugged team that is, you know, in some regards similar to maybe what Ohio State would be, a, a respectable opponent, no question about it, I think that that may have caught some people's attention to say, look, you're going down basically playing in their backyard. You better have your best game ready to go. 
So we've got one prediction on the chat. It's 48-17 Ohio State. Uh, <laughs> that would be a mighty I don't know about show. that. <laughs> That's, it's going to be a better game than that, I think. I, you know, we've seen some spreads come out. Ohio State favored by 38 over Oregon State, the opener. Uh, favored by one at Penn State and uh, favored at home by nine over Michigan. Uh, that's some interesting stuff, I'll say that, uh, before we know anything really about these teams. Um, obviously, Urban Meyer would take those results and, and not play the games if, <laughs> if he could get I haven't seen one on TCU, but I would think it's probably a two-touchdown line in that range, I would think. But uh, I think it's going to be a, a very competitive game. Always enjoy the discussion with Steve Hillwagon. Join his work at uh, Bucknuts, uh, the platform for Ohio State Athletics on 247. He's the senior Big Ten writer for 247 Sports. Uh, Steve, we've taken a lot of your time. We appreciate you stopping by, going down memory lane, setting us up with the cornerbacks and safeties and place kickers. So we want to remind everyone who's joined the chat uh, during the back half of the conversation that uh, you may want to rewind this whole post very quickly and you can catch the rest of the conversation on YouTube at Mark Rogers TV. Steve, we appreciate it. Uh, we'll catch you soon. All right, Mark. Take care.